Minister, I'm so glad you're here with us. Would you please stand and let's worship together.
about the cross. Jesus has given so much. He gave everything. He gave His own life, His very life, so that we could have life. Are you grateful this morning? Amen. Um, we're so glad that you're here this morning. If this is your first time, we're especially glad that you're here. Um, on the back of your bulletin, there's a place uh, called the Connect Card. We'd love to connect with you just to get to know you, send you an encouraging note this week. If you'll take that, you can put it in the offering plate when it's passed after a while, or you can take it to the welcome desk out in the lobby, the great desk out there. We have a gift for you. We'd love uh, to give that to you today. On the back of there, a place for prayer requests, and we really do count it an honor to pray with you. We do that in our staff meetings on Monday, and we carry them with us uh, all week long. We're so excited about what uh, is coming up. Next week is Fifth Sunday, so on Fifth Sunday, we worship together in one service, 1030. Heart Song will be here from Cedarville University. We'll be celebrating baby dedication, baptism, and uh, communion together. I'm going to do just a little bit of teaching about each one as we lead into those. And we'll uh, spend the day worshiping together around uh, the cross and around um, the changed life uh, by the gospel and about what God has in the future as we uh, dedicate little ones. And so I encourage you to be here for that and also mark the calendars. May the 3rd, 4th, and 5th is coming, our uh, Engage Mission Weekend. It is going to be so awesome, so awesome. You don't want to miss it. Friday evening, the banquet, and you see information. We have tickets out there. It doesn't cost you anything to come, but you got to have a ticket because we only buy food for the people who sign up to come. So you want to uh, make sure you get your ticket for that. Um, and then uh, Saturday morning, we'll be doing... Uh, mission project together through your life group on Saturday afternoons our golf tournament to raise funds for our students to go on mission and then on Sunday morning um, Tom Pendergrass from Urban Crest Baptist Church over in Lebanon is going to be here to share in that service as we make our engaged commitments for missions for the following year and uh, as we look and see how God would have us surrender to go on mission and to pray for our missionaries we got a lot of missionaries coming all the way from Niger in Africa to Boston to Calgary. Uh, Chris Laura is going to be here. It's going to be a great weekend. Even if Chris is here and probably beats me in golf. So uh, it'll be a great weekend. Let's pray for continue to worship. Father, I thank you for your incredible grace and gift of love. God, your gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. Your word says that there is no name given under heaven by which someone must be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. And it's because of that, because of our sin, He came. Because of our problem, because of our hopelessness, He came. And because He came and He gave His life. That there is no more beautiful name for us to worship. So we exalt the name of Jesus today in this place. And it's for His glory that we listen to Your Word today. God, change us with the power of Your Holy Spirit. Leave this place living, living for Christ. It's in His precious and powerful and holy name I pray. You are the one at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. <coughs>
inspiration, I turn to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my
last Saturday night, June 1978, when it says, Out in the darkness, I called to heaven. That was me. It was that night in my bed. I knew that I had no hope without Jesus Christ. And I called to heaven. And I thought, because I was religious, I thought I understood what it meant to know Jesus. But that night, out of my desperation for Christ, out of my desperation for hope, something beyond just going to church and religion, God stepped it in and invaded my heart and life. And I surrendered my life to Him. I understood then what hope, what real hope actually was. It's not religion, people. Is a living hope. When you do like what I had to do this weekend, what I had the privilege of doing this weekend, and that's going to the hospital and standing and praying over someone that the doctors have said there's not anything else we can do, you can stand there and you can pray with confidence because you know there's hope in Jesus Christ. And you can face whatever you're facing today because there's hope in Jesus Christ. He hasn't forgotten you. Father, thank you for the hope in Jesus Christ. And because we've experienced that hope, we want others to experience that hope. And so even now as we give, we give an act of worship and gratefulness for your grace and mercy in our lives. And, and our de declaration of our dependence on you because we understand that everything we have, all that we are, it belongs to you anyway. So we give back out of obedience and out of grateful hearts. So that others may know the hope of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that we would be good stewards of that. And even as we give, as we continue to worship, God, I pray that you would speak into our hearts and our lives. Change us. with me. 
bless our busy times to speak the love that's in your name. And uh, maybe see your next worship with us. I invite you to take your copy of the scriptures and turn to Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13. As we come to the end of this um, study and look at Nehemiah together, I would remind us that this story of Nehemiah is not about building a wall. The story of Nehemiah in the text is about rebuilding broken lives and broken communities so that we can reflect the glory of God to the nations. Chapters 1 through 6 were about the news that he got, the burden that he got as a result of serving the king in Persia. And he asked to go and he went and he led the people to rebuild the walls of the city. Chapter 7 through 12 were about the ensuing revival that came as the people realized that it, the walls were finished but their lives were still broken and they were drawn back by the prophet Ezra and Nehemiah as their leader to the word of God. The word of God began to do its work in their hearts and lives and they experienced great revival. They experienced celebration as well as conviction and God brought them to himself and so we see at the end of chapter 12, they uh, repopulated the city. They made a covenant together to keep certain things. The things that they're prone to do to wonder from God, they're going to keep those. They're going to commit together to follow Christ together. When we come to chapter 13, some time has passed. Nehemiah was in the city of Jerusalem rebuilding the walls of the community for a period of 12 years. And then he went back to serve in the house of the king in Persia, just as he had promised him he would. He would go and do the work, and then he would come back and serve. But at some point in time, we don't know exactly how much time, but probably at least a couple of years, a few years had passed. And Nehemiah, whether he got some news about the city or whether he uh, just wanted to go back and visit it, we don't know. But the text will tell us that he asked for leave again from the king to go back to Jerusalem. And when he goes back to Jerusalem, he finds that so much of what they had worked to build, so much of what they had worked to accomplish was now in shambles again. Nehemiah is probably not overly uh, surprised at this, the history of the nation of Israel would tell you that this is kind of the roller coaster that the nation has gone on and following Christ that things would happen and they would fall away. In fact, if you read in Exodus chapter 32, you find that Moses had left the children of Israel to go up on Mount Sinai to meet with God to get a word from God. He wasn't gone that long and he comes back down and finds that the people have left the God who had parted the Red Sea for them and taken them out of slavery. He, they had left him and they said, we'll just worship a golden calf idol instead. It doesn't take very long for people to stray from God. General William Booth, who was the founder of the Salvation Army, said this to some uh, leaders that he was training. He said, it's the nature of a fire to go out. You must keep it stirred and fed and the ashes removed. For those of you who grew up like I did, where we cut firewood every Saturday in the fall so that we could have wood burning in the stove or in the fireplace all winter long, uh, we knew what it was like. If you were the last one up at night, you had to stoke the fire. You had to get the ashes out of the fire so that it would have room to breathe. And then you loaded the wood in on top of it so that it would last. And if you were the first one up in the morning, you did the same thing again. You got to stay after it fire burning. Brennan writes it this way, complacency in the spiritual life can make one numb to the effects of sin. The Apostle John in 2 John chapter 1 verse 8 kind of says it like this, be careful, guard yourself so that you don't lose the things that you worked for and accomplished. Because passiveness will lead you to a place where you drift from God. When I was a teenager, there were a couple of times during the year that were extremely special to me. In the spring, um, the association of churches we were in would hold uh, the annual Sweet, Sweet Spirit Revival. 
what made it so sweet and special was that the churches from all over the community, all over our county, for 10 days, would set aside time and we would meet in a different church each night. And God would I, I remember my little league baseball coach, Joe, getting saved at the Sweet Sweet Spirit Revival. And he changed. I remember that. And then and, and late in the summer, we would go to camp. The yeah, same churches would go to camp together. And, and parents would go and, and serve as chaperones. And Miss Kay Brammer would make her famous biscuits every morning. It was heavenly. But God did a work in my heart many times. And I could take you to specific places in those churches and in that camp when God did especially awesome things in my life. Spiritual markers in my life. But I can also tell you that for most of my teenage years, I went on a roller coaster spiritually. I went from the high of the spring, and then it would fade. And then I would go to the high of camp, and then by about the end of August, when school had really set in. And I was kind of back in my routine. To this spiritual roller coaster. Instead of on a solid trajectory, making progress in my journey with Christ. And I would tell you that the building of the wall and the revival that happened is a spiritual marker of the life of the people of Israel. But if they weren't willing to put some things in place to make sure that they were regularly investing in God's Word and collectively holding themselves accountable for obedience to God's Word, they would drift. Even in our church, in, in any church, there is a really good point to projects and events. If they're done with a specific purpose, strategic purpose, to help us take large strides, to take strides forward in our spiritual journey individually and together, but you'll know this about me and about what I understand about the church. We've got to have a regular strategy for helping people make progress in their spiritual journey. That's why we have life groups. That's why we pretty much keep it simple. Worship, life groups, serve and minister, go on mission. That's it. Everything else ought to support that. It's, it's really difficult when you go from high to high to low to high. Roller coasters get really frustrating. Nehemiah chapter 13 is probably <coughs> the last portion of scripture ever written historically in the Old Testament. And Nehemiah is going to come back to Jerusalem and help them do some spiritual spring cleaning. He's going to help them do some spiritual spring cleaning that they should have already been doing. And maybe it just took his courage <coughs> to help them go from just passively doing the journey, passively reading God's Word, being obedient, and doing God's Word. Nehemiah's leadership is probably needed, and he gives some direction in four areas. They seem competitive because if you go back a couple chapters, they're just addressing the same four areas that they were dealing with a few years earlier. And sometimes we need some spiritual spring cleaning. Let's read the text together. The first thing we're going to see is that they need some persistent protection. Persistent protection. Verses 1 through 9. At that time, the book of Moses was read publicly to the people. So they were still reading the Bible. The command was found written, and that no Amorite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God in the temple. Because they did not meet the Israelites with food and water, instead they hired Balaam against them to curse them. But our God turned the curse into a blessing. And when they heard the law, they separated all those of mixed descent from Israel. This wasn't a racial thing, this was a faith thing. Now before this, the priest, Eliashib, had been put in charge of the storage of the house of God. He was a relative of Tobiah. Remember, Tobiah was one of those bad dudes. 
kept coming against the Israelites. Listen to what happened. And he prepared a large room for him where there had previously been stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, and the tents of the grain, new wine, and fresh oil prescribed for the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, along with the contributions for the priest. He was living in the temple. The enemy of the people, the enemy of God, was living in the temple, and the high priest had let it happen. He invited him in. While this was happening, I was not in Jerusalem because I had returned to King Artaxerxes of Babylon in the 32nd year of his reign. It was only later that I asked the king for a leave of absence so I could return to Jerusalem. Then I discovered the evil that Eliashab had done on behalf of Tobiah by providing him a room in the courts of God's house. I was greatly displeased and threw out all of Tobiah's household possessions out of the room. I ordered the rooms to be purified and I had the articles of the house of God restored there along with the grain offering and frankincense. They had let two, two enemies, adversaries of God into their midst. There's a difference between inviting people who are not God followers in to hear and learn about God. It's another thing to invite people in that are already against God. They don't want anything to do with God. In fact, they want historically to try to drive you away from God and let them into your midst. And why do they do that? Why do they do it? not persistent effort given to protect the faith. The Moabites, the Amorites, they were born, the peoples were born out of the incestuous, uh, incestuous relationship with Lot with his two daughters. You can read about that in Genesis 19. There was a time when the Moabites, and you can read that in Numbers 22 to 25, when the Moabites, the king Balak, was trying to uh, overthrow the Israelites. And so what did he do? He called one of the prophets, Balaam, in Israel and said, I'll pay you off if you will pronounce a curse upon your own people. And every try, time he tried to do it, God turned it into a blessing. So if I can't get the prophet to go straight against the people, to come right up against the people and call for a curse upon the people of Israel, then what am I going to do? I'm going to invite the people of Israel to come in and have dinner. Now, he's not saying don't have dinner with lost people, don't have dinner with people who are not believers. That's not true. Jesus did that. But they were inviting the people of Israel and so that they could influence them. And they did. In fact, they influenced them not only to accept some of their ways, but also got some of them to marry their sons and daughters. In which case, they became idol worshippers. And then they took it back and moved back into Israel. And they took their idol worship with them. And you know what happened? 24,000 people died. God is serious when he says you shall have no other God before me. And as a result of that, he cursed the people of Moab that those people, when they were idol worshippers, were not welcome in the temple of God. We're not going to have people who are trying to draw away people from worshiping the true and living God are not going to have them in the temple. Now, the people who were Moabites, like Ruth, we read in the Old Testament, who said, your God shall be my God. I turn away from my gods. I'm going to worship the one and true God. They were welcome. But they weren't going to let the people who were trying to draw them away in the temple. Then you find Tobiah here. Why was he not? Because Elisha, the high priest, Stop trusting God. They thought he needed to have an alliance with somebody of political and economic influence. So he not only lets him come and worship, he invites him to come and he gives him a room. He cleans a room out and makes a house for him, makes an apartment for him right there in the temple. And as a result of that, Nehemiah says that he gave him the room where all the tithes and offerings were. They replaced all the tithes and offerings of the people with a guy who had money, but didn't love Jesus. Nehemiah took decisive and passionate action on this thing that matters so much. 
there's an old saying that says, uh, keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer. You ever heard that? That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's nowhere in the Bible. Just like the cleanliness is next to godliness, um, I appreciate people who take a bath, but that's not in there. <coughs> what we do sometimes is we allow the culture and even some of the pithy sayings of the culture to infiltrate the church. We start using them ourselves in context for <coughs> conversations and it's totally unhealthy. We need discernment to know the difference between peacemaking among our neighbors and friends and co-workers and protecting the faith from the enemies of God. Vance Hatter said it this way, Satan's not fighting churches, he's joining them. He can't defeat the church of God, so he's going to get in and try to mess it up. There's no place in the house of God, in the church of God, for people who want to be divisive. For people who pursue divisiveness within the church are being used to the devil. <coughs> Jesus' last prayer for the church was that we would be unified. And people, because of our visible love, our noticeable love for each other and how we work together, that they would know that we're followers of Him. Paul, when he's talking about protection, being protected proactively, he says in Ephesians 6.12, for our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the world powers of the darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. We're not fighting people, we're fighting the enemy, Satan. Nehemiah says we've got to be, we've got to be persistent in protecting the faith. Second, so we find consistent in a bad investment. We need to be consistent in our investment chapter. 13 verse 10. I also found out that because of portions uh, the Levites had not been given, each of the Levites and the singers performing the service had gone back to their own fields. So they didn't have any offerings. So the Levites, the people who and the singers, the people who were, they committed to, uh, to providing for so that they could serve in the temple, they had to go back to their villages and work in the fields. Therefore I rebuked the officials saying, why is the house of God been neglected. Remember back in chapter 10 and 11, they said, we will not neglect the house of our God. And so he's asking the question, why have we neglected the house of God? I gathered the Levites and the singers together and I stationed them at their post. He brings them back and he puts them at their post where they're supposed to be working. That's faith, because right now the room's empty to provide for them. Then all Judah brought a tenth of the grain, the new wine, the new oil into the storehouse. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouse of the priest, Shelemiah, the scribes, Adam, and Padiah of the Levites, with Hanan, son of Zachor, son of Mananiah, to assist them. Because they were considered trustworthy, they were responsible for the distribution to their colleagues. And then he prays, remember me for this, my God, and only raise the deeds of my of faithful love I have done for the house of of my God service. Eliasha, the high priest, said allowed Tobiah to come in, giving him a place, right in the place where the other leaders were supposed to be provided for. So what happens? The other people of spiritual influence had left. Now it's just Eliasha and Tobiah. Now the guy who was brought in to help maybe to influence the economic status of the temple had actually gotten rid of the spiritual influence of the leaders. When we look to someone other than God as our provider, we begin to make compromises in every area of life. When the spiritual life of the leaders diminishes, one of the things that happens is the provision of ministry tends to go down. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 says, Moreover, it's required in stewards and a man be found faithful. And Nehemiah says, I'm going to put some faithful men in charge of being stewards of God's house and God's resources. But what's it mean for us? 
the reality is, is that when there's spiritual decline in our personal lives, one of the first things to go is our stewardship of God's resources. Spiritual decline will show itself in our giving, in our generosity. It's one of the first things to go. Matthew 6.33 says this, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then he says, And I'll add all those other things unto you. says the labor is worthy of his hire. The Levites and the singers were it wasn't because they weren't working for it. I love what Lord Wears be said. He said, we need to be laborers, not loiterers. One of my favorite things about our partners in Nicaragua with chosen children is this if you're not willing to work, you won't stay in chosen children very long. If you're a pastor there and you don't prove yourself to be have a good work ethic, you won't get support. They require a lot before they even start putting a dime into a pastor. They've proven themselves already that they're committed to the ministry, committed to God, committed to the Word of God, committed to growing personally, and committed to being a good steward. The last pastor that I visited there, um, and you've seen pictures of the folks from Nicaragua here, the most of the barrios where these pastors live, the house is a stick hut with plastic and maybe some sheet metal on it. And when they've proven themselves faithful, they'll send a church like ours in and they'll go build a one room block house. And if you're really fortunate, there'll be one wire with a light bulb running there. The last time I was there, I met Pastor Luis. Pastor Luis had left a three-bedroom home on Main Road with running water to go live in a barrio and a stick up for the sake of gospel. When I went there to meet him, I walked up and I thought, where's, where's Pastor Luis? Where's Pastor Luis? And they said, he's over there digging a latrine, an outhouse, for one of the ladies in the church so that she could have a bathroom. And I walked over, and in his hand was a post hole digger. And right beside him was a, um, a mat, you know, one of those in And a shovel. He doesn't speak English, but I went, went over, and someone introduced me to him, and I said, my name's Art. You know what he said? He shook my hands and grabbed a shovel. <laughs> you know, there's something to not being lazy on behalf of the gospel. And it, it proves that in all of our lives, too. In our work, we should be models of those who labor well. Whatever your field is, we should model that. That's a Christian ethic. That's a biblical work ethic. But then what we do with the resources that God provides as a result of that really does reflect where our heart is. Matthew 6, 21 says, For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. They had to make a consistent investment in the work of God, the house of God, and it had hurt them spiritually. And it really just revealed where they were personally, spiritually. Persistent protection, consistent investment. Third, we see intentional worship. Verse 15, at that time I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath. They were also bringing in stores of grain and loading them on donkeys along with wine, grapes, figs. All kinds of goods were being brought to Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So I warned them against selling food on that day, the Tyrians living uh, there were importing fish of all kinds of merchandise and selling them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. So I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil you are doing, profaning the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same so that God brought all the disaster on us and on this city? And now you are rekindling his anger against Israel by profaning the Sabbath. When shadows 
began to fall on the city gates of Jerusalem just before the Sabbath. I gave orders that the gates be closed and not open till after the Sabbath. Nehemiah says, I'm just going to shut the gates so that the vendors can't get in. I posted some of my men at the gates so that no goods could enter during the Sabbath day. Once or twice the merchants of those who sell all kinds of goods camped outside Jerusalem, but I warned them too. Why are you camping in front of the walls? If you do it again, I'll use force against you. And the word there says, I'll come and take care of you myself. He said, I'll come out there and run you off myself. After that, they did not come again on the Sabbath. Verse 22, then I instructed the Levites to purify themselves and guard the city gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this, my God, and look on me with compassion according to the abundance of your <coughs> love. They put their business at the priority of worship. Exodus chapter 20 is where you find the Ten Commandments. When God said, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, He didn't prescribe a whole lot for it. But He was saying, I want you to make a priority of rest so that you can worship Me, so that you can focus on worshiping Me and take your focus off of what everything else it is in your life. And you can focus on Me. You know, the first time we read it in Nehemiah that they were gathered together reading the Word of God, they stayed together for six hours. The second time we see that, they read the Word of God for three hours and then they worshiped for another three hours. And, and sometimes it honestly just amazes me at the reasons people give why they don't come to church. Well, it's the only day I can rest. Really? I mean, I, I watch these days how early the kids get up and go to school. I love my friend Brad, who lives in Georgia now. He used to live in Ohio. And um, he puts a pet fo uh, post on Facebook every Saturday night. Takes a picture. He's got his Bible, his car keys, his wallet, his checkbook. He takes a picture of it and says, usually around 8, 8.30, and he says, all right, boys and girls, it's time to get ready for bed so that you can focus on worshiping God in God's house tomorrow. And the reality is, is we pretty much do what we want to do. I, I'm not a, like a basher of people who do like AAU sports and all that stuff, but um, when you play AAU sports, you get up and start games at 8 o'clock on some days, and people don't complain about it. But coming to church seems to be the thing we struggle to get to. Setting aside two or three hours to worship God and be with your brothers and sisters in a small group. It just like it's too much. Really? We we do what we prioritize. I read an article this week, and I actually reposted on Facebook why I attend church. And after I read Tom Rainer's Ten Reasons Why I Attend Church, I kinda had to ask myself the question. Would I still do this if I wasn't in vocational ministry? If I wasn't a pastor, would I still do this? And God searched my heart on that. And, but the answer is, I was doing it before I was in ministry, and I do it still. It's that important. I love you. I like hanging out with you. Why would I not want to come? Why would I not want to go to a small group? I need you. You need me. I feel like I want to sing a Barney song. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for us in the New Testament church, uh, Sundays are special because it's the first day of the week where we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. It's also the Sunday was the day that the Holy Spirit came people of God were mobilized to share the gospel and the church was perfect. We should be concerned about sanctifying the Lord's day, 
thought about making a some legalistic checkoff list, just sanctifying the day so that we worship Him, so that we set aside time for Him, so that we build up the body of Christ. Because life's hard. <coughs> Life is hard. We need each other. I wrote down this statement. I can't tell you who wrote it, but I wrote it down. We do not do anything to be accepted before the Lord, but because we have been accepted before the Lord through the blood of Jesus Christ. We don't come to church to make God happy. We come to church because God's made us free. And He's made us His. And it's like going to Sunday dinner at Daddy's house. And He feeds us. Finally, intentional worship leads to courageous families. We need courageous families. Verse 23, in those days I also saw Jews who have buried men of, or women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of other peoples, but they couldn't speak Hebrew. Nothing wrong with speaking other languages, but God's word was in Hebrew, and they couldn't read God's word. They couldn't understand God's word. I rebuked them, cursed them, beat some of their men, and pulled out their hair. He was serious. I saw you stick there, brother, as uh, you walked in, and I thought, man, you might have a hold of that. I forced them to take an oath before God and said, you must not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters as wives uh, for your sons or yourselves. You're like, well, you, Nehemiah got violent. Well, it may have been part of the covenant that they made back a couple chapters earlier. That if we do that, pull our hair out. Beat us. He may have just been doing what they said to do if they didn't follow what they said. Listen to what he says to give them a history lesson. Didn't King Solomon of Israel sit in matters like this? There was not a king like him among the many nations. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Yet foreign women drew him into sin. He got him to worship other gods. Why then should we hear about you doing all this terrible evil and acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women? Even one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of the high priest Eliashab. So the grandson of the high priest had become son-in-law to Sanballat, the Horonite one of the enemies of God. So I drove him away from me. Praise again, remember that my God for defiling the priesthood as well as the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Spiritual purity is constantly threatened in our family relationships and our economic relationships. The truth of God's word is consistently threatened in our lives? Will we follow it when it's hard? Will we follow it when family relationships are at stake? And when our pocketbooks, our wallets are at stake? Will we follow God's word? Or will we pursue the things that get us the most influence? If the generation was lost in the faith, what would be the nation's future? I can tell you what the nation's future was. 400 years of silence. My God. 400 years of silence that God didn't speak. First Kings 11 tells us how Solomon ruined his life and his reign was king. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7 39, he directs believers to marry only in faith. He says generations will suffer. When we marry outside the faith, generations suffer. Vision 6 with Paul is talking about family relationships. And then he goes straight. Notice what he does. He goes straight to talking about the armor of God. We need the armor of God in our family relationships. It's hard to stand for God when family is at stake, when relationships are at stake. It's hard. We need the armor of God to do that. And he says in verse six, uh, verse uh, chapter six, verse thirteen, he says, "And having done all of this, stand. Having done all this, worked on your family relationships, put it on the armor of God, put it on the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. 
When you've done all of that, and you don't know what else to do, just say it. They might call them to stand. It's critical that we take a stand for the faith in our families because the situation is dependent on When you make a decision to compromise the Word of God in your life, when you make a decision to compromise the Word of God and marry outside of the faith, when you make that decision to do that, when you make the decision to take a stand that's not based on the Word of God in your family, it's not just impacting you, it will impact the generations that follow. Kidner writes it this way, a single generation's compromise could undo centuries of work. That's true. Let's look at our history. Centuries of work to build a nation that would be established on the foundation of the principles of God's Word in just one generation. Work of all the generations ahead can be lost. Nehemiah finishes the text, verse 30. So I purified them from every foreign, everything foreign, and assigned specific duties to each of the priests and Levites. I put some controls in place. I put the priests and the Levites back on duty. And I also arranged, verse 31, for the donations of wood at the appointed times and for the first fruits to so reestablish sacrifice. People brought sacrifices. They had to think about their sin. He brought the wood in. And he prays one more time, remember me, my God, in favor. Nehemiah, Nehemiah makes provision for the city and the people going forward. It reestablishes good practices and discipline. When you do spring cleaning, we often use the term cleaning out the cobwebs. Remember the illustration from a few weeks ago? Nehemiah wasn't just cleaning out the cobwebs, he was killing some spiders. And for us, we need not only to clean out the cobwebs, we need to go ahead and kill the spiders. Cleaning out the cobwebs makes us feel better about ourselves. Washing the windows makes us feel a little better about ourselves. So, and spiritually speaking, but we need to kill the spiders. Keep making cobwebs. I still remember hearing uh, a preacher say one day, repentance is the most beautiful word in the Bible. I'm not sure I totally agree with him, but most of us will get this thing called repentance. Changing, not just being sorry, but being sorrowful enough to change, to respond with obedience. Most of us look at that as a negative, but it's really a beautiful thing. Because here's the reality. God could just let you go. And there's a time when the Bible says that with believers, God just turns you over to follow your own thing, to destroy your own life. And when God allows you to be confronted with our sin, to be confronted with our own patterns of veering from Him, it's a gift of God's grace in our lives. It's not because He hates us, it's because He loves us. And refusing to allow God to confront our hearts, refusing to allow Him to confront our hearts with our own sins and our own patterns of destructiveness, refusing to do that is to refuse His love. We should be encouraged by the evidence of God's grace when we have that impulse in us to repent. To say, you know what, Lord, you're right. That's confession right there. I confess, I agree with God that He's right. When we repent, we return from that. We trust Him to fill that gap. The gap we've been trying to fill with something else, we trust Him to do that. <coughs> I remember standing in Poland back in 2014 and hearing the stories of Black Malenza. He was one of the labor leaders who became president of the country. He said this. He said to be a leader means to have determination. It means to be resolute inside and outside with ourselves and with others. And I would say to the dads, moms and dads, you need to be resolute. 
about following Jesus, not just with yourself, but with your kids, with everyone who lives in your house. To be one along with Joshua to say, as for me and my house, the people who live in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to do it. We're resolving to do it. Spiritual spring cleaning is a time for proactive repentance and renewal to reset priorities and to experience a refreshed sense of God's presence and work in our lives. If you're here this morning, if you're a follower of Christ, let me ask you a question. Is repentance a normal part of your journey? Is repentance a normal part of your journey? It's a positive part of your journey. And if it's absent, I would tell you, I would question whether you're a follower of Christ. Because none of us are perfect, and so we all deal with sin. And if repentance is never a part of your life, I would question about whether or not that you're God's child. Because the Bible says that whom He loves, He chastens. Is repentance a normal part of your life? Is it a part you resist or a part you embrace? If you're here this morning, I would just tell you, look, um, repentance is a beautiful thing. It's that opportunity for you to get right with God and to be on the same wavelength with God. It's a relationship so that you can pursue knowing Him and serving Him and loving Him in a way that He meant for that. Maybe you need to do some spiritual spring cleaning. And then put some patterns in place for you and for your family. That doesn't allow the spiders in. And if you're here this morning and you're not yet a follower of Christ, uh, let me just say this. God does spring clean. God does this thing called sanctification. He makes us to become more like Christ if we're his child. But let me just say this to you. Uh, God's not trying to clean you up. You don't get cleaned up and then come to God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that when you come to God by faith in Jesus Christ and you turn from your sin and you trust Christ, that He makes you new. He's not trying to make you some better version of yourself. He wants to make you new and make you His child. I'm going to pray. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. And we're not going to sing for long. But I want you to make a decision. Am I going to let God do His work in my life? Or am I just going to leave here and be the same? That's the deal. And you make that decision today. Father, thank you for your grace in our lives that allows us to know you, that draws us to you, even, even to the point of repentance. So God, would you continue to do your work in our hearts and lives? Would you give us the faith and the courage and the love for you, God, to, to draw me out and let you draw us to repentance when necessary? We love you. So help us now, even as we respond. I'm going to ask you to just remain seated right where you are. You can bow your head. You can do what you want. I just ask Zach to, to sing something for just a minute and let us have a moment to respond. If you want to come to the altar and pray, someone to pray with you. I'm here for that. But you respond to Oh,